<laughs> That's happening. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, for inviting us to, uh, to your atelier, this beautiful place. You're very thank welcome. You. Thank you. This is, um, uh, uh, this is paradise. We're trying to unpack something you're working on. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is, uh, it, it's funny you say that it's something I'm working on because, you know, this is old, but I'm still working on it. Mm. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I move backwards in life. And, but I, I thought we would start with this because everything I do has some kind of bearing on it. I think and I can help. Should I? Yeah. No. Sorry, it's not that one. It's this one. <laughs> um, that's um, that's part of the staircase in the um, in the concert hall by Tengbom, mm -hmm. but it's scale two to one, mm -hmm. so it's a double scale, yeah. which is really weird. Um, and and I love playing with scale, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, there's something happening, you know, when you reduce something or when you upscale it. I mean, upscale is really, really weird. Um, and the half scale is also weird. Hmm. So both uh, one to two and two to one are really strange scales. Um, it started with um, when uh, I started practice-based research or what we called artistic research. Um, it was a way to look at things in a way that would never occur either in uh, at the office nor in education. Mm. Um, and use our own means um, in, you know, to, to actually press them to some kind of limit. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm obsessed with permanence um, because it's impossible, nothing is permanent um, and yet it's very interesting in architecture because there's so many cultural um, processes that have dealt with trying to make architecture permanent, mm. like uh, translating a very um, fragile, temporary building mm. into a permanent work that is forever. Like, I mean, you go back to Euphrates and Tigris, you know, to the Sumerian, um, and you will have the reed buildings that are eventually made in stone to last forever. Mm. Um, so I try to do that, but with, with our present time. So this is a permanent window. It's just a detail of a window at Helleforsnes in um, Sörmland. Um, it's a very odd window, actually, very odd angle, because it's, it's placed in a, a transplantation uh, building between two, uh, two buildings. It's a foundry that uh, started in the 1600s and ended in 1990. Anyway, and this building in particular is from the 30s and oh. so they needed uh, a fast route between two long buildings and it's it's um, a skewed both in both directions, both horizontally and vertically. So it's slightly sloping and it's skewed as well in plan. Let and let the funny thing <laughs> is that the, 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 the window, so this yeah. is the window, it's following the skewedness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so funny. And I only know, and, and this is an enormous, no one knows who designed this, you know. And I, I, I recall Sigurd Lebrans when he does the, um, the rowing club, yeah. out here, not long, not far, far away from, from here. From here. Mm -hmm. uh, he does the same in the staircase, so he lets the, the windows follow the shape. Oh, yeah, right, so right. They, it's, it's almost as if, as if they were liquid. Yeah. Um, well, let, let me just ask you, is it, the, 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 the fact that you put it on paper, does it make it permanent? The act of putting, you know, of drawing it. Let's see the, ne the, the yeah. next one. <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah, I think um, 
Of course not. I mean, this is very perishable. But I'm, I'm delaying it. Mm. And then I've been thinking about... Delaying what? Sorry, can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, it takes a lot of time to oh, make yeah, a drawing right, like right, this. Right. So mm. I think architecture is about expanding time. Mm. Because we are, I mean, our, our, our minds are very fast, but our bodies are quite slow. And I mean, if you look at Palladio, he's, um, he's starting the building out in the landscape. Mm. He does everything to prolong, to, pro to, to make your body understand the space gradually. And, and so it's, it's projecting, a, you know, it's like pulling things out, out, out. Um, but I think, I mean, you, you might as well, you might look at art as a way of making time permanent. I mean, uh, if you think of Gerhard Richter's painting Stoke on, Stroke on Red, which is, he's doing that painting when painting is dead, right? Video art. Um, and it's, it's just a, a massive stroke with a pencil on a wall, right? Incredibly huge. And, and in a way, what is he doing? He's actually permanenting the action of painting into... And, and I think a lot of art is like that. A lot of painting is permanenting time. Um, uh, whether conscious or not, it's, it's an interesting aspect of it, at least. Um, another thing that happens in these drawings is that... I? They are kind of in between things and drawings, right? Um, they are now they're, they're, they're drawn. This is a permanent door, mm. <laughs> so it's kind of. I, I wanted to work with very everyday things like a chair, a table, mm. um, a door, a window, a bench. And, and see what I could extract from them. So, so, and, and also, so this is done with a um, very hard pencil, yes, like pencil drawing, yeah. 10H or mm. 9H. And so all the outlines are with very, very hard pencil. And then I, I put a, a, a kind of paper tape that photographers use. Mm -hmm. and, and then I work with a 9B a very soft graphite mm. uh, stick. It's thick like this. And it's, you know, just circular movements like this. And it almost gets, if you see it from this angle, you get the kind of metallic yeah, feeling. Really. So it's, 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 it's gets a kind of singliness. It has a material, materiality of its own. Sorry. Mm. That. And, and I mean, this is done a long time ago. And, but I, already at that time, I had the feeling that, I don't know, <laughs> it's um, Wittgenstein who said that maybe uh, humanity in the future will show their grandeur, not in what they are accomplishing, but in what they refrain from accomplishing. <laughs> it's very provocative for uh, modern man to, to, to think that way because and if you think and if it's it's talk with the uh, yeah. Jörg Henry von Wrigt and the myth of progress I mean it's the same type of, of thinking mm. that our, all our values are based on, a th on, on the idea of that creative creativity is about newness and about making things and it, it's about doing things right it's, it's about resisting you know? uh, and and <laughs> to, yeah so to produce oh. so a lot of things that are maybe maybe architects will also show their uh, sensitivity and intelligence in in refraining from from building yeah. at times some architects have already done that um, yeah there was a was it um, I, was, I was wondering, in preparation for this uh, for this uh, visit, uh, you mentioned the um, this fundamental discrepancy between the drawing or the act of translation between the drawing and the space. Mm. Um, 
and um, or between the drawing and the the artifact. Mm. Um, how, how do you how do you understand that act of translation? How do you overcome its difficulties? Or is it by it's end endless difficulties actually, and and that that's why it's so compelling, really, uh, because everything is just a kind of approximation, and there is no way that you can ever know exactly how it will be. And I mean, I, I had a very important teacher for me was, was Robin Evans. And of course, you have his seminal essay, uh, Translation from Drawing to Building, and, and how, where he describes, um, actually describes, he starts by actually talking about uh, James Turrell and the early work Afroproto and how that type of um, room or space or work is not born in the drawing. Uh, it's actually born in endless observations. Mm. Uh, and then he goes on to talking about the capitals and the um, 19th century um, architects um, insisting on making very, very delicate and extremely precise drawings of capitals and the shadows. And he points out that what they do when they do that is that they are describing how the capital at the, the moment where, where it takes all the pressure is, is dissolved. Hmm. That, that's where, because the light and the shadow actually breaks it up as a shape, so it has no solidity. So Elizabeth, could you tell us about the, um, uh, the things you've uh um, that's it on the on the window. Please. Well, I had to put up the the paper, uh, the tracing paper, anyway, because uh, I had too much sun and I wanted diffuse sun. And it also uh, I'm not looked at when I'm drawing, <coughs> which is quite nice. So there are two drawings here. On the, on the left is a one to twenty drawing, uh, which is um, a sketch for. A sanctuary, or you could call it a shed, uh, in plan and in section, and superimposed on the plan and section of the shed sanctuary or shrine is a table, uh, which is wider in one end and more narrow in the other, with room for 12 persons to sit. You see a three here. To there. Um, and you see the table also in section here and a bench. And they are both conceived for a particular place, undisclosed. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, they're not very large. Well, the, the table is actually very large. And they're both like, I'm dreaming of actually that they will be made one day. But I'm still working on them. Uh, and uh, they are trying to be quite permanent. Mm. Probably last for a thousand years, I hope. Um, so, and, and the other is, the other drawing is, is from the, an exhibition which is on right now in, in Dublin, which is uh, my contribution to alternative histories. Uh, where, uh, which is curated by, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Drawing, about, drawing matter, yeah, and Neil Hobhouse. Uh, it, well, you're actually not curated by him, no, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we should come back to that. Um, uh, a, a group of, of really talented architects in, in Belgium, and what they do is. So, Dickie uh, there wasn't, he was part of the. So uh, they, what they do is that they choose drawings from uh, Drawing Matter, uh, Neil Hobhouse's uh, uh, incredible collection of drawings, and they pair the drawing with architects. And so it's up to the architect that to look at the drawing as if it was theirs mm. and make a model departing from that drawing. 
and I got Frank Lloyd Wright, which was crazy. We can so, return. So this to is a, an inter interpretation of, of one of Frank Lloyd Wright's um, buildings. N well, n no, not, not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a model that is departing from a drawing by Frank Lloyd Wright for a very particular building that didn't live very long at all. Uh, it was uh, Midway Gardens, an incredible. Uh, project conceived in 1913 by mm. Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, built in 1914, same year as the World War I uh, exploded and uh, it was uh, uh, like a beer garden, you know, it was mm. an, an enormous fun palace um, uh, with uh, so very that... much exterior space and uh, Visions of um, yeah, thank you, Christina. Yeah, you me yeah this how nice. Uh, I mean, so this is the this drawing is, you got. Uh, this is the drawing yeah. I got, and if you see this little perspective sketch, is from one of the towers. So basically, it's a kind of infrastructure for fun, right? And he's testing these towers, and he's imagining this. This pole sticking up in the air and with balloons that would kind of rise like the bubbles in the beer or in the champagne. Um, and, and then there would be greenery as well, as you see here. It's a beautiful drawing. And, and I was, of, of course, completely shocked to, to get a Frank Lloyd Wright drawing. Um, but it, it was uh, an incredible opportunity to start looking into that period of his work because after this he, this is like the last building of of the um, of the prairie style I, you could say mm. and after that he becomes much more heavy and uh, like almost like oh, graves mm. and there is a particular incident that happens at the same time when this is inaugurated in August 1914 that's when the uh, his lover, uh, Mama Buton Brothwick, is uh, axe murdered, and her children and four people in in his uh, household at Taliesin, mm. and the whole place is set on fire. So, so he never returns to to this site. Um, but I couldn't I couldn't avoid that uh, incident when when looking at this work and when looking at this it's kind of the dream of festivity and then it's so black really uh, what happens and, mm. and also the architecture is actually a little bit austere I mean there mm. is something almost uh, you know you, I think of almost the the, the second world war mm. you know and a bit nasty architecture there's something heavy about this presumably light architecture. And that's what and you brought into your, your model? Yeah, the that, model that, is, is in Dublin at the moment, so I don't have it here, mm. but it's, it's, it's basically it's a grave, it's a vanitas. It's, it's, um, it's made with things that were in my studio. I, I didn't buy anything, I just took remnants to from... from um, do you want to show it on the on the computer? Yeah, uh, I can do that. We could return. Yes. Uh, um, so I, I took uh, a slaughtered uh, Tempietto model, and I took pieces of iron and uh, so like bric-a-brac from your studio. <laughs> yes, not only bric-a-brac actually. No, 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 also, I'm just no, but actually, it was uh, part. The the starting point was actually sorry, was actually. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So the starting point was actually this. Um, this piece of iron that is a model that I made of a uh, kind of infrastructure of, of a kind of um, like a platform and uh, and then this is uh, part of a Tempietto model and this is uh, part of La Rotunda and so is this and this is a piece of iron from Irish uh, glass bottle factory uh, in Dublin and so one side is projecting eternally, like the architect who, the male architect who projects, you know, and the other side is kind of falling into the depth of the earth. 
right? It's sort of like a big breast here. Do you, anyway. What, what about the scale of this uh, of this model? Do you have any any um, it has no idea scale. of of No, it has no scale. But imagine it built. What would it be? Or you know, it what would size not, would it be? It would never be built. Oh, it's, right. it's a grave. <laughs> would you <laughs> would you it's, like, uh, that? <laughs> it's um it's a kind of I don't know, it's uh, it's about, in a way, it's about non-building, I think. Mm. And I have the uh, the balloons, the collapsed balloons here as well. Um, and even I have, sorry, I think, yeah, I have part of the, the, the Madonna of, of, of Giotto, who is, um, of course, serene in this vanitas and, and turned towards the earth. Uh, anyway, so, so, but that's an in exhibition that no one can see, but you can see it online. And, and, um, but before I actually link to that is um, the other drawing on the left of the shared sanctuary. Oh, yes, right. Mm -hmm. And the table. Um, because that's something that is ongoing and um, maybe it could be built, you never know, but it's, um, the wish to make, oh yes, <laughs> look at this, oh. um, this wow. is a strange drawing because it's four meters long, mm. 4.2, um, because that is 1 to 20 and this oh, is 1 to. to 2, right? So you see here the section of the shrine or sanctuary and you see the outline, the more narrow outline, uh, the narrow end of the table. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, it's made, the drawing was made exactly in this spot. Uh, and I could only... Like, so it was rolled over the um, table mm. and so I could only, of course, draw one section at a time. So, you, right? you so I, had, I could of, of... have no overview. Yeah. So I had to have uh, an absolute control of the geometry of the drawing. And, and it's a very, very... Um, particular feeling of making a drawing like that. To be in the drawing? Um. Yes, because you have to have complete trust that you're going to actually, it's all going to end up and add up mm. to the right dimensions. Mm. Um, so these are not columns, <laughs> they are plates. <laughs> That's the plate in section. Oh yes. yes, yes. Um, and of course, to to draw like this is uh, actually very meditative. So here you have, uh, this is again part of the plan. There is a niche. Um, it's a door. Uh, so here is where the, the section meets the plan, so to mm -hmm. speak. So there is a seat on the outside. And then because it's, it's confusing because it's superimposed with the table. So it, suddenly you have one of the plates, but this is a window or a light intake. So you have a kind of passage here and then you okay. enter the little chamber. Yeah, I think and the idea of that is that the roof of this shrine is collecting rainwater. So the whole mm -hmm. building is just a rainwater collector. So the water is led in inside the building into a basin and then along the grove and through the building and down in the earth. So it's like a kind of a metabolism. Okay, Elizabeth, could you could you please uh, speculate a little bit for us uh, about the current state or status of architectural drawing? Hmm. Uh, what is its role and function for mm. contemporary practice, um, mm. but also for the imagination of architecture today? Mm. 
Oh, it's, it's, it's an enormous question. <laughs> so, of course, I mean, I... <laughs> and, and you are now in the most analog architecture studio in Stockholm, right? <laughs> and I, I don't even do any drawings on the computer. It has never been in a, something that was necessary for me because I lead my projects in, uh, without it. So in a way, I think it's an impossible question because most of, of architecture is done, almost all, 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 all architecture is now done on computer drawings. And some computer drawings are developing into some things really, really beautiful, really fantastic. Um, but it's always different from hand drawing. And what is quite interesting to see now, so I have no idea. I mean, I think, you know, you could statistically say, well, the architectural hand drawing is dead, you know, yeah. Uh, except that it isn't. <laughs> as little as painting died when everyone thought that painting would die, you know, that, you know, and it's only video art or, you know, that, that didn't happen. And, and ceci tuera pas cela, right? So it will survive, of course. And what is really interesting to see is that um, some architecture schools that are really alert and um, interesting, drawing is, hand drawing is coming back. Mm. Uh, so I think that is uh, a very interesting and for one thing people react to hand drawing differently mm. than to computer drawings uh, because it's it's like recorded music or going to a concert you know where you're there in flesh and blood, uh, the, f the physical world is so, you know, you can't avoid it, right? And I, I think, I mean, all, all my students draw by hand and I've just recently just finished a, a course with 50 students drawing the floors of St. Mark's Church. And these floors, they were not even drawn they were just built. So these are the first drawings <laughs> of them, you know, which is quite interesting. And some of these students had never drawn mm. by hand. So I had to sit and show them how to turn the pencil and tell them, you know, you, you have to use 6H and harder. Mm. So they went up to 10H. They didn't even know, you know, why you need to use a clutch pencil that is two millimeters and not a, one of these very thin leads that you just press because you have no stability in it. So anyway, um, it is different to hand draw. And I think eventually people um, realize that. And, and why, I mean, they both can convive. My mm. students work both on computer drawings and on the same, they, then they print and then they work by hand on the same drawing, which mm. is fantastic. I'm also thinking your, your, your career or your, your entering into, into architecture, re-education and your early years of practice were very much entangled with uh, dramatic transformations of architectural drawings when they mm. went from from falling into oblivion to being rediscovered and mm. recoded and and uh, invested with a very different value um, you know the the era of the of the paper architecture mm. Um, mm. rediscovery uh, or at least that's the, you know that's the way the story goes <laughs> Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and your experiences from from some of the people you worked with and and you know what what do you take with you um, in today and in the future from from those encounters? Well, being taught at the AA, you know, with with people like uh, Fred Scott and Robin Evans and Dalibor Vesely, and I did a project with Bernard Chumi as well, and and you know. There was uh, an incredible insistence on, on, on the drawing and on the craft of the drawing and the expression of the drawing. Almost to, um, not in 
Bob and Fred's uh, unit, but uh, in other parts of the school, I thought it went too far. You know, it was, you know, it became just image, right? Image making. And um, I was actually turning against that. I was dying to build. And uh, I, I mean, that was really good with the AA. It made you really, really want to build because they didn't give you that. They gave you a lot of other things. Um, so, and then to draw, to draw, to build is something extremely exciting and difficult. How do you know, you know, how, how large to make something, you know, mm. the extent of things. You always, you always underestimate the need for extent. It's something I try to um, convey to my students, you know. And, and the only way to do it is going between the drawing and the real thing, back and forth, back and forth all the time. Observation is half your education. Mm. It's, and it's, it was so wonderful. I had invited Peter Merkley to give a lecture to my Irish students. And he gave the most beautiful lecture. He has been very, very important for me, actually. Uh, discussions with him and, um, on architecture and, and looking at architecture with him. But he, in, in this lecture, he, he told the students how long it took him to learn how to see, how to mm. observe something. Um, that he was very insecure at the beginning and, and that he learned more about architecture from Hans Josefsson, the sculptor, sculptor, than from anyone else, because that was about seeing. And so I visited Hans Josefsson with Peter Merkley and uh, that was amazing. And we, it's, and then we went from from his studio, discussing his sculptures, to Peter Merkley's studio, and with the same kind of element of trust. It's an absolute trust of, of you know, how. And it's funny because Peter, he only draws, he doesn't do models. So. It, I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking, what you're mentioning here um, sculpture and architecture as. Um, are they parallel or the same? Oh yes, oh, you're, you're quite moving a good in question. between them. Yeah, yeah seamlessly. I, my whole so life I, I have been between them. Yeah. and mm. it's because my father was a painter. My mm. my mother was an archaeologist. I go backwards in life, and I'm very very dependent. And I'm an art lover. I mean, I buy art. I bought a, an amazing sculpture by Michael Warren that he made. He took the frame of a chair from the 1960s, an Italian chair. It was just the frame, it was, it was broken. And then he started altering that frame. Uh, so when you place it on a table and you touch it lightly, it starts rocking. It calls tempo rubato, stolen time, right? Mm. The, the rhythm that Mozart is, is using, because you, you, you you steal the rhythm, but you have to give it back at the end. So I bought that cast in bronze, carried it on my head through Dublin. No, I, I, I'm very dependent on both. I'm, I'm an architect, but I tend to flirt with the other arts. And your, your engagement with scale um, and moving between scales and, and using you know, man manipulations of scale uh, in order to, to understand um, what you're working on. I'm sorry for putting it in a blunt way, but um, could you say a little bit more about that? That was also a key element of your, your contribution to the Venice Biennale, which you are saving for, a, for another occasion uh, to, to look a little bit closer. Scale, scale is so yeah. tricky, uh, for the reasons I mentioned just before, is because we are very physical and, and scale is about relation. It's nothing about measure, it's about relation. So uh, the, uh, to know, uh, to, to judge or kind of guess scale or, or make any decision about scale, you have to visualize or understand or observe or test the relations of, of other rooms that will 
have an impact on whatever you do, right? But then when, when, when I talked about scale and drawing, I mean, the drawing is, it's both, um, there's so many different drawings to begin with, you know, so it's very presumptive to, to say anything general about drawing. It's, it's impossible, right, in a way. But, but, but when I talked about uh, these funny scales, the half scales, uh, up and down, um, it's uh, since all drawing is just an approximation of what is ultimately built, uh, you can use it to explore and, and test extremes in order to maybe get a little closer to what you aim for, right? Um, but then sometimes a sketch can be very accurate suddenly and capture some kind of character that is absolutely decisive for how you will work the project. So that's also fascinating. Sometimes you get lost in the kind of discipline of the drawing, mm. the geometric discipline. Um, so I, I, I think it's an approximation, right? <laughs> That's the best I can do today. 